Hello and welcome to the Closers Podcast. I am your host as always, Marco Alvarado. Joining me as always is Quinn the Moondog Kalani. And today we have kind of a nerding out episode for you guys. We had a uh, guest scheduled. Unfortunately, things had to change a little bit, but it's no biggie. Um, We're able to still pull through for everybody. And what we're going to do is talk about one of the things that is very near and dear to Quinn's heart. What is that, Quinn? I I would I wouldn't just say my heart. I'd say it's near and dear to all hearts. If anyone who anyone who has hope in their heart, who longs for something better, a brighter tomorrow, oh. I dare say. Oh. Uh we're going to get balls deep into some MC and you news. <laughs> and uh talk about that for a little bit and then we'll cap it off with a sports recap like we always do before getting into our weekly recs for the week yep so there's a little outline for you for this specific episode the 15th episode of our second season but before we jump into mcu talk please i must say follow us on instagram at the closures podcast on facebook at closures podcast and subscribe to our youtube channel we are the closures podcast you can follow quinn on Instagram at quintessential, what was it? Quintessential thirty nine. Thirty nine for Action Jackson, Stephen Jackson, the greatest Rams running back in franchise history. I forgot that he wore thirty nine, but yeah, it's true. And you could follow me on Instagram on my personal Instagram at Mark Avocado. That's M A R C underscore A V A C A D O. And without further ado, Quinn, what news? Would you like to start off this discussion with? I feel like regardless of where we start, we're going to be able to hit on really everything we want to just because we are that excited about the new news that has come out um, across the MCU landscape. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. The universe since the pandemic has been has been uh, darker for us Marvel heads, uh, more so than other fandoms. But... There is a light at the end of the tunnel. This past week, two major, major things happened. One was a giant casting announcement, a Jade giant casting announcement. The other uh, was the debut of a trailer, which we'll get into afterwards. But the first uh, major news, the casting announcement is for the Disney Plus She-Hulk series yes the jade giantess herself playing jennifer walters aka she hulk will be uh the great the magnetic tatiana maslani i love the casting it's amazing perfect as close to perfect as you can get in my opinion if you've seen the show orphan black then there is no need for concern this was This was, it was not the casting we suspected. I think a lot of people were pulling for uh, Allison Brie. There was so much fan art out in the world of Allison (laughs) Brie. And sometimes that kind of puts like a, like a, just like a seed in your mind, you know? Yeah. Uh, But dude, this one came out of left field and it was a nail in the coffin because it was fucking perfect it is perfect i love this i love this casting and like you said before we recorded she resembles mark ruffalo it looks like they can be roughly related uh, which brings us into uh she hulk's backstory quinn what is she hulk's backstory for the more casual fans out there so she hulk aka jennifer walters is actually bruce banner's cousin she is a lawyer and what basically happens how she becomes she hulk she is gunned down um, in a in an act of gang violence or a uh, a hit, if you will. A gang violence. 
Erwin would be so beseeched <laughs> to hear. The hero known as Wundo <laughs> would be would <laughs> would take it personal. Yeah, he would. Um, so it, pretty much, she's bleeding out. She's on the operating table. Um, things are looking grim, and her only salvation lies in an emergency blood transfusion by one Bruce Banner, aka the Incredible Hulk. Bruce ends up giving her his blood, and she transforms into what we all know as the She-Hulk. But there is a caveat, hmm. because it is a second-hand uh, gamma mutate exposure. Mm-hmm. She does not. Um, she doesn't go into the uh, the quote unquote savage, uh, the savage Hulk phase. Yeah. That we all associate with Bruce. She retains her intelligence and her consciousness. She pretty much skips the savage phase and goes straight into what what we Bruce Banner heads would call the professor phase, oh, or okay. the Doc Green phase. Yeah. Um. So she so she starts out where we see Bruce Banner in Endgame. She has oh, okay. full co- she has full cognitive uh, function and control of her whole persona. That makes sense. And uh, the dichotomy is the interesting thing is where Bruce looks at his affl- as uh, the Hulk is somewhat as an affliction, you know, a disease. He's you know, I'm always angry, Cap. He's afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I was made for this. Yeah, it's like I was made for this. <laughs> Jennifer, when she becomes the Hulk, she sees it as liberating. Ah, I see. And so she chooses to remain in her Hulk form for the majority of her day to day life. So she starts, she resumes practicing law again as She Hulk. <laughs> her comic, uh, The Sensational She Hulk, which I believe debuted in the early 80s, uh-huh. and I haven't gotten too deep into it myself, but uh, from what I understand, that it's a very comical comic. Mm-hmm. It's very whimsical. Yeah. And pre Deadpool, she was one of the first. Uh, characters to break the fourth wall and address the audience directly. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. So, very, very interested to see how uh, how She Hulk is going to develop. Uh, much like we were talking about in our last MCU conversation, yeah. She Hulk's head writer is another Rick and Morty alum. Uh, it's interesting that so many alum from Rick and Morty are being uh, cherry picked by Marvel. Yeah, it is, especially. Especially considering that Rick and Morty have such a uh, such a uh, such a tendency to lean into the multiverse. Yeah, they do. That's like their whole show. Their whole show is basically based around like the idea that there are multiple universes and multiple versions of a person uh, that bounce around from universe to universe, from dimension to dimension. So the uh, the head writer is Jessica Gao. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. Jessica oh, okay. G A O. Uh huh. Um, and she is quite renowned amongst the Rick and Morty uh, fandom for being the uh, writer of the Pickle Rick episode. Oh God! So but... she will be. Uh, she will be heading on the episode that ruined it all in she some won't. of their eyes. <laughs> I I honestly I haven't seen a lick of Rick and Morty, so I couldn't oh, tell really? you. I've only I seen like you. that episode. I mean, it's a, it's an okay show. Like it's it's a good show. It's just like I don't I just personally don't see the hype around mm. like the 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 ridiculous amount of um praise that that show has gotten. But it, I mean, it is a good show and I enjoy it, but it's not like I watch it and I'm just like, "Oh my god, this show just is talking about you." Like I just I don't it is interesting. I've heard quite celebratory things about that episode. So you're telling me that there's a there's a wide variety of reactions to the Pickle Rick episode. Some love yeah. it, some hate it. Because I think what I've seen and what in the circles that I have been in online uh, to a degree that have really liked Rick and Morty prior to the Pickle Rick episode is that that episode got so viral and so big that people like mm. casual, a lot more casual people started watching that show where before it was I very see. much a cult following. So it put the show into a mainstream, into the mainstream. Naturally, there'll yeah. be some pushback against that. Yeah. I understand. That. Yeah. I went through a similar thing when ESPN picked up the UFC. Exactly. But uh, as we were talking about earlier, it's interesting Loki is also being worked on by Rick and Morty writer. Mm. She-Hulk. Is WandaVision? And, 
that I don't know, but I do know that Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness mm. is also uh, having some work done by some Rick and Morty alum. Interesting. I want to get to Multiverse of Madness in a second, but to transition the conversation a little bit into another beloved Marvel character, if I may. In the third Spider-Man movie, there is apparently, there is a theory that there is going to be a trial held against Peter Parker for the crimes, oh, yeah. quote unquote, that he has committed in killing uh, Mysterio. The suspected crimes. Yeah, suspected the suspected crimes. Yeah, the suspected crimes. And he's going to need a lawyer, right? And mm. that theory, there's two, you know, thoughts on it from what I've seen now and from what I've heard and gathered that she Hulk could very well be that lawyer that defends Peter Parker in that third movie. That is one theory. And then the other theory is that daredevil, Mr. Murdoch himself defends Peter Parker in that movie. Which, which one would you rather see more and why Quinn? I would prefer to see Matt Murdoch represented in a, uh, in a third Spider-Man movie, mainly because there is already a uh, there's a history there cinematically uh -huh. between Spider-Man and Daredevil. And if we think back to the Spider-Man animated series, one of the few uh, movies that came out of that universe was a movie featuring Daredevil. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, you mean you wait? Do you mean like? Back when they made like really shitty like spoof versions of them, like back in like no the no 90s. no this is uh this is back in the day, uh directly from the animated series. I remember oh, renting this movie animated from movie. yeah from okay. Blockbuster. Never mind. Um, it didn't have a specific title. I think it might have been subtitled Man Without Fear, but it was just Daredevil versus Spider Man on the old animated series. Remember the theme song? Wow. Spider Man. Yeah. It was like a like like electric riff. Yeah, I remember that. Uh so there is a uh there's already a cinematic uh prerequisite there. Mm. Plus considering, you know, you got Queens, you got Hell's Kitchen, yeah, you got a man with extrasensory powers and a kid with extrasensory powers. Yeah. Come on, it's right there. It's perfect. Do you think that I mean, it's apparent that they're re they're just pretending like the Netflix movie or their Netflix uh, episodes never counted in any sort of continuity. Like they're their own universe, basically. They're treating it as such, correct? Because they're not bringing any of those episodes over onto Disney Plus. They're leaving them on Netflix, and uh, right. they're not they don't have any intention of bringing any of those characters as of right now into the MCU like movie right in the, any movies as of right yeah as of right now i think perhaps that might be a safe assumption now the rights to those characters do expire at the end of the at the end of the year in the beginning of next year mm. right around the time spider-man 3 goes into production oh i thought they were already filming no 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 oh. uh, right now uh now right now i think tom holland's film filming enchanted oh. not enchanted <laughs> The Uncharted, uh, the Uncharted game adaptation. Oh, he's gonna be the star of that. Him and Mark Wahlberg. Oh, oh, God. Okay. Marky Mark oh. and the Funky Bunch. Oh God. Lost in the Sahara, <laughs> in the Serengeti. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. But uh, hopefully by the time, or at least presumptuously by the time they do start production on Spider-Man Three. Uh huh. The Netflix characters' rights will be freed up, and there is a possibility, perhaps, that Charlie Cox is brought back as Matt Murdock Daredevil, that Vincent D'Onforio will be back as Wilson, Wilson Fisk, a.k.a. Kingpin. That'd be sick. He, perfect casting. Perfect, perfect casting. Perfect. And perhaps, fingers crossed, that John Bernthal, the man, the myth, the legend, Shane, <laughs> would be back. As Frank Castle, Frank Castiglione, yeah, aka the Punisher. That'd be cool if they just kept those three like series as part of the con like continuity, but they just pretend like the Defenders never happened. I would be fine with that. Personally, I was cool with Jessica Jones. I, I like Jessica Christian Jones Ritter too. Did an amazing job. Is I like Jessica, Jessica Jones. Jones. I like I like the guy Jones. that played Luke Cage too. I liked him too. And they just Sweet have Christmas. if they just recasted. Iron Fist. Iron Fist. It would have been fine. And the thing is, I I feel like they just kind of got tired. The whole Netflix thing. 
So, like, to see them in movies and at least be, like, supporting characters of the right. Avengers on the side, I don't see that as a negative thing. I just don't. I think the the problem was with the Netflix universe is that they were doing, like, what, 10 to 12 episodes a season? And that's so much fucking extra story that is not required. Yeah. The thing that I love that Marvel's doing is they're doing six to eight episodes for WandaVision, for Falcon and the Winter Soldier. That coinlines perfectly with a six issue arc. Yeah. In comics. Six issues is your standard arc, you know, to this day. And so to get six to eight episodes, you know, that's a chef's kiss. Yeah. That's true. That is very true. And also, one show we haven't brought up at all is uh Hawkeye, right? Yeah, Hawkeye's uh Hawkeye's still in production or pre production. They haven't announced who's gonna play Kate Bishop yet. Oh, they haven't. Which I know. I thought no, they did. Which no, no, no. There was uh suspicions that Haley Steinfeld had signed on. Uh huh. But as of yet, there's been no official no official drop on any of the new shows as far as casting goes between Hawkeye, uh Moon Knight, mm, yeah. Ms. Marvel. And Tatiana's Maslani as She-Hulk is the first real big uh, casting announcement. Besides, of course, we talked about this last time, Jonathan Majors as King the Conqueror. Right, that's got to be cool. Um, but going back to going back to Spider-Man. Yes. There is a uh, there was a post that came out a couple weeks ago. From who? That one of the greatest wrestling legends, the Doctor of Thugonomics himself. Oh, man. John Cena! (laughs) Put out a post with him of, you know, some fan art of him as the Sandman. Which would be epic. I loved it. I love that that potentialness. That'd be crazy. That'd be super cool. It'd be freaking awesome. Yeah. Would Sandman be able to be used by the MCU per the new agreement? Because they was used in the Sony movie back in the day. Um, so wouldn't right. it be fall? Wouldn't that character fall more in line with like it would be in the same universe more with Venom and Morpheus or Morbius? My bad. Well, we know Morbius is uh, Morbius is cross pollinating with the Spider Man MCU because the tag at the end of the Morbius trailer features Michael Keaton. As Adrian Toomes, yeah. a.k.a. the Vulture, mm-hmm. you know, kind of a cheesy line. He sees <laughs> Jerry Leto walk by and he goes, what's up, Doc? <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> but apparently, you know, according to to some, you know, according to Internet Chatter, the uh, the Marvel Sony uh, relationship has been better than better than ever. Uh, Olivia Wilde has just been tapped to direct a Sony Spider project. People are uh, are uh, speculating that it could be Spider Woman Jessica Drew. That'd be crazy. Do you think that Sandman? So would Sandman be the like third movie villain? Because Craven the Hunter is still like rumored, right? Speculated, yeah. And there's also Scorpion. If you remember, Scorpion uh, was in episode. Uh, I almost said episode one, but he was in Spider Man Homecoming. Mm-hmm. He was running the. Uh, the kind of what was it the smuggling industry on the boat yeah and then you know he kind of got into a conflict with spider-man spider-man kicked his ass off the boat yeah and then at the very end he just like he he turns his head he has a giant scar and it has like a he has like a tattoo of a scorpion scorpion, (laughs) yeah and then in uh in the prison scene the tag scene he meets up with uh vulture adrian tombs again and he's like i hear you know the identity of spider-man and vulture you know is like having a moment of of a strong character yeah he's like don't know it can't help you <laughs> pulls a double a on him <laughs> yeah yeah so i think i i think it's possible i don't i don't know if uh spider-man 3 is going to actually be the sinister six movie that a lot of people are hoping for that's not the way i would go i wouldn't go that way either i think it needs more I'd build say up. it needs more build up it's called the sinister six for a reason Let's get five movies deep, and then for the sixth one, episode six, that's when you drop the Sinister Six Because on I feel like with the Sinister Six, what makes the Sinister Six so, um, like, what makes it work so well is that each of those villains has a giant gripe against Spider-Man. Peter. Yeah. Peter. Or Peter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Peter. 
And and if you just like shoehorn in three of the other villains right. without giving them a proper backstory, without setting them up at all, right? I don't see. I don't. I I don't see how that could be successful because I mean you already have seen we already seen Spider Man three the last one the last Spider Man three with, and you had three villains in there and it too convoluted it was too much exactly so Sandman Venom and uh, Hobgoblin Harry. yeah 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 it was just too much so what I would do personally is I would take which next villain you want to add into Spider Man three honestly if they use Scorpion for Spider Man three or the the third you know, of the homecoming and far from home series. Right. I would be fine with that. Um, I'd be cool with it too. Or even if they have John, let's say John Cena is casted as Sandman. And I don't think he's actually part of the sinister six in the comics, but, um, I, he's part of, he's part of some iteration. There's been hundreds of iterations of the sinister six. He may not be one of the original members. I'll look up the original members. The original sinister six consists of doc. Ock. Yeah. That's not not gonna not gonna be featured. Electro not gonna be featured. He died. Remember, yeah. <laughs> remember Jamie Fox? Oh, played as Electro no. in the Amazing Spider-Man Two. What, and... what was the guy that that Shocker? The Shocker. 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 I like Shocker. He was always one of my favorites. But remember, the first Shocker died, and then the uh, the black dude picked up the gauntlet, True. so he lived. Yeah. So the original Sinister Six is as follows: Doc Ock not gonna be in it. Electro not gonna be in it. Craven the Hunter, possibly we do know J.C. Chander has been tapped to write and direct a Craven the Hunter movie. I think that's stupid, but who knows? <laughs> um, Mysterio, Jake Gyllenhaal, yeah, Vulture, Michael Keaton, and your sixth original member of the Sinister Six is in fact Sandman. Really? Okay, yeah, yeah, so yeah. in that case, yeah, then you can have Sandman be tapped in. Honestly. And this is going to shift us actually perfectly to the next little topic we're trying to hit on. We're just hitting these topics today, man. I'm proud of us. We're moving along. If they get, I believe his name is Alfred Molina back. To, as Doc Ock? As Doc Ock. It could very well work out. And now, let me, no, I know you're shaking your head, but let me tell you how. We already touched on this idea before with Rick and Morty. The multiverse, my friend. The multiverse. And what movie is slated to delve into that world in Phase 4 that we know of right now? It is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. Oh, yes. And which is going to be directed by... What's his name again, Quinn? A little-known director. Little-known director. uh, In no way historically significant, whether in the, the overarching, you know timeline of cinema or spider-man itself little known director you may have heard of him sam raimi with alfred molina reprising his role as doc ock possibly in my version of events Mm. the the multiverse would open up during that first battle at the bank between doc ock and peter parker played by toby mcguire where he took Aunt May to the bank. To yeah, get, to yeah, get a loan. <laughs> yeah. So, so Doc Ock is in the is in the thick of his hatred towards Spider Man. He hasn't seen the light yet. Both figuratively, bags of change at him. Yeah, both figuratively and literally has not seen the light yet. And um, and the multiverse opens opens up, and they fall into present day New York City in the multi like through the multiverse jump into the current timeline of MCU and Doc Ock links up with um with uh the other members, you know, Vulture, Scorpion and, you know, uh Sandman if, you know, that's going to be a thing at the time or Craven or uh Morbius as well. Mm. That that in my opinion would be really really in, in like really fucking awesome if they just kind of like tapped into the idea of there's multiple universes, and in this one case, you know, there's this crossover that's able to happen. And then Tobey Maguire and Peter Parker, like the Tobey Maguire Peter Parker and the Tom Holland Peter Parker, team up uh, down the line and take on the Sinister Six. That'd be pretty fucking sick. That'd be pretty awesome. I, uh, it's a good idea, but I venture very differently from it. My idea for the Tom Holland Spider Man overarching is nine solo films. Three that take place in high school. 
three that take place in college and three that take place as Peter Parker as an adult. Uh Uh-huh. This next Spider-Man, I think, no Sinister Six. Your villain should be Sandman and Scorpion. Multiverse of Madness. I don't think it should bring in Doc Ock. I'd like to see a new Doc Ock. And I'd like to see a different I'd like to see a different story spin on it. Wow. And I'd like to see a different actor take it on. But in Multiverse of Madness, this is where we establish that, that the Sam Raimi universe is in fact canon. Just a separate universe than the one we know, Marvel 616, 616, mm-hmm. quote unquote. Yeah. The cinematic universe. And that that is in fact the ultimate Marvel universe. The universe that breeds Miles Morales. Which one? Ours or the one that has... The to- Sam Raimi one. Okay, the Tobey Maguire Sam Raimi. Okay. With eventually what happens is Tobey Maguire dies and passes the mantle to Miles Morales. Mm. Bam. That's how that needs to go down. I, we introduce yeah. the ultimate universe by having Tobey Maguire Spider-Man help Doctor Strange in Multiverse of Madness, you know, you know, settle all those threads. Mm-hmm. Pun intended. <laughs> and um, yeah, that's where I would go with it. That's where I wouldn't. I wouldn't go. You would. I think you're right to hold off on the Sinister Six. That needs to happen down the line. You wouldn't to ha- where you wouldn't have Tobey Maguire and Tom Holland meet at all. No. Oh come on! That has to happen at least once, man. Even if they fight. <laughs> even if they fight, just like. Some great, like, rhino. Even if they just fight Dan and DeVito as rhino or some shit. <laughs> like, like that would be just fan service. Like, come on. That has to happen. Yeah. I would love See, that. See, that, that wouldn't happen in a Marvel, in a MCU proper film. There's no way Sony would let that happen. That would happen in a Sony partnered with Marvel film. When they do a Spider-Verse film, that may happen. Then how would we be able to have... Toby Maguire in the uh, Multiverse of Madness. As a supporting character, he can be featured. Without... In, without, in a without. MCU proper film without Tom Holland. I mean, they'd have to work it out between Sony. Okay. But I think Sony would be on board with it because it would build so much hype. Yeah. And we, we got to remember, you know, we don't want to commit so heavily to the Spider-Verse we just want to give a little tease, a little a little appetizer, a little sample platter. Yeah, you're right, because that can be expanded upon down the line. And when there's right. already so many other properties that are slated to be introduced. Like X-Men and, gotta, and Fantastic Four. Right. And you also got to remember, one of Sony's biggest financial uh, booms is Venom. Yeah. So there's no way they're going to do a Spider-Verse and not include... The billion dollar franchise known as Venom. Do you think that do you think that the uh that Sony would be Sony is where the Sinister Six movie would take place, as opposed to in the MCU? Do you think that, that No, would... I think it would take place MCU proper. You think so? Sony Sony needs to be built up as the Marvel Ultimate Universe. The universe that ultimately gets destroyed when Doctor Doom, you know when the occursions start happening. We've talked about this before. Secret Wars. Mm. When universe the multiverse starts collapsing onto itself. Yeah. That's uh that universe that collapses directly with the main Marvel universe is known as the Ultimate Universe. That should be the Sony universe. And that leads us directly to another rumor out of Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness that there may be some recast of some characters we will know who I don't know if you're familiar to this, Marco, but there's been a who? potential leak no. or a snippet of a rumor. No, don't tell me it's so there. There can be a ultimate universe, Iron Man and Captain America and two names being tossed around. Tommy was and Greg Sestero, Tom Cruise <laughs> and John Krasinski. Oh, my fucking God. As the ultimate universe version of the Avengers, Captain America and Iron Man imagine i'm just i mean like <laughs> could you imagine a ultimate universe avengers with john krasinski cap iron man tom iron, cruise tony cruise toby Maguire, spider-man and how about this what if we also did ed norton or eric Bana hulk and then who would play thor 
Who's an alternate be, universe there, cast? There doesn't have to be a Thor on that team. No, it could. It could be his brother. Um, uh, <laughs> Liam Hensworth. Yeah, Liam Hensworth. <laughs> or, or yeah. you bring in old man Logan, Hugh Jackman. Oh, I don't know. He died. His arc's done. I don't understand oh, how true. how that that's could. True, true. I don't know how that could make sense. But if there's one thing that the old X Men know how to do, it's to not make sense. So, in that that's respect, that's also true. That's also true. Or you could do X twenty three. Oh yeah, Wolverine's daughter clone. Yeah, you could. You could. Who- and that that could be the alternate universe team. That'd be pretty gangster. They have to help Doctor Strange. Who could be the Wesley Snipes? Or, or, or I just gave it away. Who could be the uh, the, the 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 Nick? Uh, Nick Fury. Nick Fury? Wesley Dude, Snipes. David Hasselhoff. <laughs> David Hasselhoff played Nick Fury back in the day. Really? Yeah, you didn't know that? Mm-mm. Yeah, David Hasselhoff played Nick Fury back in the day. Dolph Lundgren also played the Punisher back in the late oh, 80s. Oh, I know. Yeah, Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> David Hasselhoff would be so funny. Dude, he honestly is the most comic book accurate looking nick fury of all time it's just funny though imagining all of these actors who are pretty fucking old minus uh john krasinski um like being superheroes it's like it i, it, I well tom cruise is around the same age as robert downey jr yeah but robert downey jr let's put let's face it looks better Immortal. looks better than uh tom, tom cruise. cruise looks pretty good i mean you're talking about a guy who does all his own stunts sure put some respect on tom cruise's name man. no i i respect them it's just like man it's just hard to imagine anybody else playing one of my favorite characters and uh it, it would be risky business but we could nah. get it done Hey-o! <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool that'd be really funny you know, to see so 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 the theory or the rumor basically would be that um, it, they would just appear in this movie, or would they become part of like the actual universe? Like, would they be included that, in bigger? That that I don't know, but the rumor is that you know it could be a hit, it could be a cameo, could just be small supporting roles. But it would be funny since Tom Cruise was the number one choice to play Iron Man before Robert Downey Jr. Mm. and John Krasinski auditioned to be Captain America. Yeah, and came in like second to Chris Evans. I yeah, Chris Evans when he first was casted, I was like, the Human Torch, really? Flame on, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, really? That doesn't make sense. He was perfect as the Human Torch too. That'd be funny if if he made a cameo as the Human Torch. As the Human Torch, that would be amazing. <laughs> that has to happen now. You know, uh, Ryan Reynolds pitched that for Daredevil. Yeah, but it didn't go through. Ah oh, man. That'd be hilarious, though. He just like comes back as like with with the mid two thousands hairstyle too, the frosted tips and everything he had in that movie. That'd be hella funny. Dude, he was he was the saving grace of that movie, man. Really, Chris Evans. Chris Evans was the best part of the Fantastic Four one and two. You think so? Oh yeah, late two thousands as Human Torch. He was perfect as the Human Torch back in the day. He, was. he nailed it. He nailed it. He did. I really like the actor who played the thing too. I just feel like he did. Michael Chiklis. I feel. <laughs> Oh my god, yes, Michael Chiklis. I, I I always felt like he didn't get um enough credit in those movies. I always thought John Cena would have been a good choice to play the thing. I know you've always been a you've always been a a, a staunch John Cena thing uh Dude, I I feel boy. like his character, his personality. I was never a big fan of his, of him when he was in the WWF world. Yeah. Did not care whatsoever the doctor of thugonomics. Yeah. Whether I'm fighting or spitting, my discipline is unforgiving. <laughs> but uh, with his personality, his charisma, oh, I think he'd be—he's a great fit to play a superhero villain or hero. Yeah. If if coach if directed and coached right, I mean, look how well Dave Batista has made that transition. Oh yeah, he's he wouldn't it, into it wouldn't act the destroyer. It, it wouldn't that be helped him. Guardians of the Galaxy without Batista for sure. Oh. Dude, and that helped him build his acting uh, toolkit, his repertoire, to Blade Runner 2049 and in Dune yep. this fall. Yeah. Or Christmas. Yeah. With, wait, who else is in Dune? Is it our boy? It's Call Drogo, yeah. Jason, Aquaman. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I thought uh, Timothy Chalamet. Timothy Chalamet <laughs> is also in it. <laughs> A.K.A. Marco's alternate universe Marco. <laughs> Oh God! Grew up in an all-white neighborhood in <laughs> the northeastern <laughs> United States. Oh God! The beautiful boy himself. 
<laughs> so what other news do we have to touch on because um i thought there was something about the multiverse of madness and wandavision that was that you wanted to wandavision about. wandavision is the prologue for multiverse of madness what's been hinted at so far is that uh wanda maximoff aka the scarlet witch will be the main antagonist of dr strange the multi multiverse i almost said the multivitamin <laughs> the multiverse of madness or the MacGuffin of the multiverse of madness. Mm. Um, and if you been living under a rock this past week, the WandaVision, uh, I said that kind of funny, the WandaVision trailer dropped uh, this past week, actually after the Emmys. And it is one of the best MCU trailers I've ever seen. It doesn't follow that traditional trailer That's formula. True. Yeah. Where, you know, here are all the coolest lines. Explosion, explosion, explosion. Yeah. Uh, this trailer is insanely dark. It is yeah, a it is. dark, dark trailer. Yeah. Um, Especially if you not, know the story already of what has happened yeah. between um, Wanda and Vision. So while none of the plot details have been divulged, what uh what I'm speculating here is that Wanda Maximoff is going through some sort of psionic breakdown. And to cope, she's carpo- she's kind of sectioning off portions of her life um into reference points from famous sitcoms, American sitcoms such as Bewitched, Full House, Roseanne. And uh she's that's how she's kind of trying to work through this psionic breakdown. Now, whether yeah. it was self-induced or induced by outside forces, i.e. Agatha Harkness, i.e. perhaps Mephisto. Ooh. Kevin, Kevin, uh, I'm going to say Kevin. Evan P. Evan Peters uh-huh. has been announced for the WandaVision. Really? But, yeah, his role is being kept under wraps. Now, some speculated that he could be playing an alternate universe version of Quicksilver. Because he played Quicksilver in the X-Men. Yeah, he did. But other heads are speculating that perhaps he could be playing Mephisto himself. That'd be crazy. What if Which he was playing kind of... both? What if he was playing, like, when she sees Evan Peters as Quicksilver, that's just Mephisto. Like, like they're basically just kind of, like, nudge, like giving an elbow to the, to the fans. Being like, ah. Just kind of a nod. Yeah, I'll nod to him. Mm, I wouldn't be into that because then I don't know. It just it just it would just feel weird to me when you have a significant casting like that. If you're gonna do just like a nod, just bring back Kick Ass. <laughs> just bring back Kick Ass. Man, I love Kick Ass. I would prefer to see Evan Peters as Mephisto. It really, when I heard the speculation, it really made me think of Evan Peters' performance in the very first season of American Horror Story. Which was the best season. He did pretty good in that season. Made a name for himself. And also, you know, he's just a tremendous actor. He is very good. Very, and very I think good. He, I think he would nail it as uh, the MCU's Marvel sort of iteration of uh, the Dark Lord Satan himself. Yeah. So, this, so the story in the comics goes uh, that Mephisto basically uh, breaks off two pieces of his soul that become the children of Wanda Maximoff, uh, Wiccan and Speed, and eventually he kind of, you know, claims he, uh, you know, seeks her out to claim back what is his. Hmm. It's a very, it's a very complicated story. That sounds very it's complicated. Very, <laughs> it's a very complicated story. How Vision works into all of this, I'm not entirely sure. Yeah. But, uh, you know, Vision is gonna, he's gonna, Vision is gonna act as, uh, act as the audience. Much like C three PO acted for the audience in uh, the Star Wars saga. Ah, right. Remember, C three PO would just offer a little tidbit in a comment like, "This is fucking mad." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> shit would just be going off. Yeah, there's a, and the part in the trailer that gives this not get that gives it away, but helps me speculate this is when we see him back in his like you know Age of Ultron get up, and he comes uh you know ascends down onto the street. Uh-huh. And he touches Catherine Hahn, who is speculated, rumored heavily to be playing Agatha Harkness. Mm. He touches her head, and she's like, am I dead? And he's like, no, why would you say that? 
She's like, because you are. Ooh. And he just has this complete bewildered look on his face. And he has the Mind Stone still in his head. Yeah, he does. The Infinity Gem. So it makes me believe that is Vision actually real? Yeah. No, it's he's probably not. Or or is he like a shade, an aspect of who he used to be? And once Wanda, you know, sorts has this breakthrough, mm-hmm. will Vision just, you know, disperse into nothingness again? Yeah. It is interesting. All these questions like when and when do do we know the date of release for WandaVision? December. It will be the lone MCU project to 2020. Wow. It will come out in December, so it, most likely off the tail end of Mandalorian Season 2, which debuts in October. So, technically, this is the first property of Marvel that is part of Phase 4 officially that we will be getting. Oh, yeah. And they didn't intend for that to happen. They intended for Black Widow to be the first thing. Black Widow was supposed to come first, then Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Then WandaVision. Mm. So it is It is interesting that they kind of switched it around. But it is important to note that Black Widow was pushed back till May of next year. And when is Falcon and the Winter Soldier supposed to come out? Do we know that? Sometime date? next year. I don't think they've given a specific date. Okay. But odds are it won't come out till after Black Widow or congruently with. Because while Black Widow doesn't necessarily affect the timeline as was Mm -hmm. rest assured there's going to be tidbits and easter eggs and black widow that will affect the timeline going forward yeah that is true particularly with how general thunderbolt ross played by william hurt what effect will he have he was was interesting enough yeah oh interesting enough how this will tie into if you know who thunderbolt ross is the hulk you know he's the you know, he's one of the arch nemesis of Bruce Banner. Yes. So it'll be interesting to see, speculation-wise, some people are thinking that Thunderbolt Ross will be trying to acquire a new serum to tra- to uh, transform him into the quote-unquote Red Hulk. And what what I'm curious, too, I, I'm honestly curious about it because the movie is on right now. As we're recording this, I'm like, not watching it, but it's just on in the background. I have it on mute. But how Ant Man is going to factor in with Wanda and with also uh, Doctor Strange going forward, since um, the few, like the two Ant Man movies, have hinted at the existence of the multiverse and an actual city that is like hidden away within the multiverse, right? Or hidden away within yeah, the yeah, quantum yeah. realm? In one, of, in one of the frames in Ant-Man and the Wasp, um, you can see a city uh, in the uh, background of the quantum realm where uh, Hank Pym goes and he you know, retrieves Janet Van Dyne. Oh, interesting. I, I'm, actually, I'm actually at that part right now. That's funny. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how Ant-Man... And the Wasp play into this as well. And where their right. place is going to be in Phase 4. They're going to kind of fade into the background and become, you know, more secondary characters that kind of j- jump into big universal um, conflicts to help the good I side. Th- or will they? I don't think so. It'll be, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, Stature, also known as Cassie Lang, yeah. daughter of Scott Lang. Yeah. I, uh, Ant-Man obviously becomes a member of the Young Avengers mm. uh, the Young Avengers also have the members Wiccan and Speed who are these twin sons of Wanda and Vision I see I see but... one of the main nemesis for the Young Avengers uh-huh. which also feature members such as Kate Bishop Ooh. one of their main villains is Kang the Conqueror so it is poten- it is possible that Ant Man three is setting up um this Young Avengers arc. Mm, I see. I'll see. go into that. Well I think She Hulk is going to uh is going to you know, I think it's really just gonna feed right into the Avengers. It may branch off into a different Hulk series. Yeah. But I think um the main branch, She Hulk, will go into the Avengers. I don't imagine the She-Hulk series. I think it's probably going to be more like a limited anthology. Okay, so she's... they'll put 
Yeah, she's going to become more She Hulk in the Avengers. Oh, okay. yeah, I got you. There's just too much money to be made in a Captain Marvel She Hulk team up. Oh, oh, come on, yeah. I thought when you were talking about recasting that you were going to talk about how people want to recast Captain Marvel. <laughs> they... Those those infidels, yeah, those Gentiles. I have no, I have no breath or patience for you people. <laughs> Do not besmirch the good name, the good, the good queen of Northern California, Sacramento's finest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we can't. You might get a Stockton slap if you do so. It's true. Yeah, we, we have no tolerance for any Brie Larson slander on here. We got nothing but love for Brie. But, um, yeah, so aside from all of that. You don't support women, bro? <laughs> aside from all of that MCU, new, MCU news, or is there anything else that we missed? That It's going to be it's gonna be super exciting. Let me ask you this. What? Let me it just real quick. What are your top three most anticipated MCU projects coming down the pike? Because right now, next year, 2021, is going to be an MCU just like insane fest. Yeah, there's going to be a ton. Oh, yeah, we could talk about that, actually. Um, First, before I answer your question directly, I just want to say how I'm kind of glad that we've had a break from MCU um, content for this past year. Because, and even before this past year, like... After Endgame came out, it was very much a there was very much a lull, and then we got Spider Man to cap it off, and then that's just been it. So, um, I'm actually pretty happy that we got a break because there are people who are like me and we're very fatigued from seeing um, Marvel movies and just going one after the other after the other. There's a lot of us out there. I know Quinn, you're not in that group. Um, and I understand you're you're a big fan. Take all my money. And that's I know, yeah. And I I mean I'm the same way. I would go and watch them even if they were to come out. But the fact that there has been distance put between Endgame yeah. and Phase Three, and now the start of Phase Four, it it re it's, it has rebuilt my excitement. Whereas before I would just be kind of like it's a like healthy break. It's like clocking into work after a certain it's point. Like Lent. Exactly. I'm like clocking into work. It's just like. All right, here I am again. Let's sit through this two and a half hours. Okay, that was cool. I wonder what's going to happen. Like, it just became a cycle, a routine that, that for me, got a little boring. Now, with all the speculation, all the rumors, all the theories, that's where the fun is for me in the MCU. And the fact that we've had time to allow for those theories uh, to cultivate and those rumors to cultivate, um, it is, it's, it's, it's made it a lot more fun for me. And I'm a lot yeah. more excited than I would have been if... Uh, in a pre COVID time. It's like uh, the ancient Catholic tradition, the yearly tradition of Lent where you abstain from something for 40 days and 40 nights. Mm. And then on that 41st day, you get it back in your life and you're like, Oh, good Lord, sweet <laughs> Jesus. This is, this is the remedy, the balm that I've been needing for my sinful soul. That is the MCU for us. Yes. Um, so going, yeah, let's quickly look at next year's schedule, 2021. So we got, WandaVision coming out December of this year may bleed over into January. But May 7th, 2021, we got Black Widow. July 9th, 2021, we got Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Yeah, no one's talking about that movie. That might That's going to be dope. Right. And then November 5th, we got uh, The Eternals. Oh, wow. Three movies next year. And then at some point in 2021, we also have Falcon and the Winter Soldier and Loki. Not Hawkeye? No Hawkeye? No Hawkeye as of right now. Yeah. And the What If series. Oh yeah, What If. Which will be uh, an animated canon series. And then to close out 2021, Spider-Man 3. Uh oh, so four movies. Yeah, so we got four movies. Spider-Man, Eternals, Black Widow, and Shang-Chi. And then uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Loki, and What If. So four movies, three shows. Yeah, that's a lot of content to get you through the that year is, that's a shit ton of content so then uh, i'm just gonna dump right on our plate so then the multiverse of madness would be in the following year i'm assuming 2022 then yeah okay yeah so the complete phase four schedule going into 2022 would be uh, i think uh thor love and thunder is the first one to come ah uh, yes uh with, probably february of uh with taika waititi directing again correct writing and directing again yeah 
So it should be pretty gangster. Yeah, Thor Love and Thunder, February 11th. Doctor Strange and the Multivir- Multiverse of Madness. I almost said multivitamin again. <laughs> March 25th. And then in 2022, Hawkeye, Ms. Marvel, Moon Knight, and She-Hulk series all to be uh, coming out. That's going to be sick. So to answer your previous question directly, which I meant to, and I just I honestly just forgot with my little rant about how I'm glad that there's been a break. Um, the three proper or the three pieces of content that I'm excited for the most. Um, Hawkeye is right up there. Can't wait for that. I'm going to be 25 by the time it comes out, but I'll be I'm still excited for it. Um, it's supposed to pull directly from Matt Faction's uh, Hawkeye run, which introduces Kate Bishop, which is one of your most uh, one of your favorite comic book runs. Yeah, exactly. That is up. And it is my favorite comic book runs of all time it's just a great comic book i highly recommend uh that run for anybody who's interested but that's my really uh it really humanize it really humanizes uh clint barton in a way that uh that not a lot of other comics have i've just now been getting into it oh really yeah no uh, it's awesome it really uh it really boils him down to his bare essentials that he is at his core a human being a man with no like extravagant superpowers exactly we definitely got to do an episode just on that series because it we can I can go all day about it. Um, but that uh, TV show, I'm very excited for to see Kate Bishop uh, be casted. I'm excited for that news whenever that comes out. Um, I'm also excited for Doctor Strange, Multiverse of Madness, and then uh, of course Spider Man. Those those are my three. Those are your three. Mm-hmm. All right. What about you? My three are as follows and i'm excluding wandavision from this since it starts this year yeah thor love and thunder mm. so i'm gonna go thor falcon and the winter soldier mm. if it's anything like uh like winter soldier captain america then it will be a sort of uh political political uh political action drama yeah what I love about uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, one, we're going to see if Falcon actually does accept th- in the mantle of Captain America. Yeah. There's so many just underlying themes that they could tap in. A black man as Captain America, long overdue. Especially in today's political climate and social climate. That's, Espe- yeah. <laughs> They're also bringing back uh, Baron Zemo. Oh, really? From Captain America Civil War, played by Daniel Brule. Yeah, I remember him. Yeah. So it looks like that they will be setting up the Thunderbolts in Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which is Marvel's kind of version of the Suicide Squad. Now, why are they called the Thunderbolts? Yeah. Well, because who do you think is their leader? Thunderbolt Ross. Thunderbolt Ross. Ah. Who features heavily in Black Widow. Yeah. That they're introducing a younger Black Widow in. So it's very possible that Yelena Belova, played by Florence Pugh, <laughs> could be the first member of the Thunderbolts. Oh, interesting. Who could act as somewhat of a state-sponsored Avengers team. So that could that could be very interesting. And then my uh, the last thing I'm looking forward to the most, I'm really looking forward towards the, uh, the Eternals and how that's going to expand on the cosmic lore of uh, the Marvel Universe. Yeah. The Eternals, you know... Are a uh, are one of the first humanoid races to ever grace Earth, co- cosmically imbued by the Celestials. Uh, you know we've seen glimpses of the Celestials, particularly in Guardians of the Galaxy. So uh, interested to see what goes on there. Kit Harrington playing the Black Knight, old school Marvel cut, wielder of the Ebony Blade. Um, real solid metaphor for addiction. Mm. the woes of being tied to addiction so i'm really interested to see what could happen there kevin feige also dropped a nugget that you know if, if how audiences were spent to the black knight it could be possible he's rolled over into the avengers so it'd be really cool to see uh kit harrington we all know him as the king of the north john snow yeah uh now an avenger can you imagine yeah what a what a what a better start to a career <laughs> oh uh how about you know the most popular show of all time game of thrones and once that ends, I'll just, you know, I'll just become an Avenger. Yeah, no <laughs> yeah exactly. The meteoric <laughs> rise of a Kit Harrington. We love to see it. Those would be my three uh, projects I'm most looking forward to. Yeah. Now, I know you briefly wanted to discuss uh, Black Panther. What, what, what should happen with Black Panther? I felt like we put a healthy amount of time between the unfortunate passing of Chadwick Boseman. Uh, if they do, 
decide to recast uh, Black Panther and re uh, basically retcon Michael B. Jordan's character through the multiverse where he's able to come back as as a Black Panther, where in that older universe, he becomes the Black Panther. And His character never, yeah, never like, stayed back. in Oakland. King T'Chaka took him from Oakland yeah. and brought him back to Wakanda as a child. Yeah, exactly. If, if that happened, I don't know what they would write to make it so Chadwick Boseman's version of the character is eternal. If, if they had, if they're going to replace Chadwick Boseman, which there's no truly replacing him, um, but if they were to continue forward with the character, I think Michael B. Jordan, because they were in the movie together, there is a way for him, yeah. for them to do it if they really wanted to. And I think that would be the best person to, ca- to cast for that role in order to honor his memory. I, uh, I don't think that'd be a bad idea. I think there's one. I think there's two routes. Two routes I would go. You either recast T'Challa entirely and just continue on with the Black Panther story, the T'Challa story. Or you kill T'Challa off in Black Panther 2 very early on, setting up Shuri to inherit the throne. Now, if I had to recast someone as T'Challa, I mean, holy shit, what shoes to fill, you know? Yeah. But if you're pressing me, here's my choice. John David Washington as T'Challa. You know him from Black Klansman. Yep. You know him from Tenant. I think he could I think he could maybe fill in those shoes. He's a tremendous actor. I think he's the only choice. Right. In that respect. If you're supposed if you're just gonna outright recast. That's the way that's the way I would lean to. I would go. But if you weren't gonna go that way and you want Cherie to inherit the Black Panther role then I understand that and I wouldn't be against it. But then the question becomes, what happens to T'Challa? What happens to T'Challa? Well, I would vote that he dies early on in the second Black Panther 2 movie. But then the question becomes, at whose hands do he, does he die by? And there's really only two choices. Namor the Submariner, who is, you know, Marvel's first superhero, even though he's been kind of morphed into an anti-hero. Or he dies at the hands of Doom. That's Victor the pick, That's the pick that I would do. I would. I think he would. He should die if he's gonna die at the hands of anybody. It has to be Victor Von Doom. Doom. It's the only one thing that makes sense to the me. greatest villain in Marvel history. What better way to villainize somebody <laughs> than to have him kill King T'Challa in the opening moments of Black Panther Two? Yeah, the world would find him absolutely and utterly repulsive. And that's what I'm saying, and and also, um, I mean, it's a perfect. It's a perfect setup as well for uh, Doctor Doom, not just because the world would find him, you know, like disgusting and and evil right. and as an evil entity, but also it kind of leaves Chadwick Bose's, Boseman's memory as his as his death is the catalyst for everything else that happens in Phase Four. So it's not right. just like they just write him out and then... Um, it would be Phase 5 at this point. Oh, yeah, Phase 5. Because Black Panther 2 is going to come out later on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Probably 2023. Yeah, it was already slated for, to be kind of a longer release. So if they if they introduced um, Doctor Doom in another movie and then he goes to Wakanda and kills uh, Black Panther, that would make... That would make it very, very interesting, and also, and like I, like we, I just said, it would basically set up the, everything going forward for the next two phases, aside from four. You're talking about the Darth Vader of the Marvel Universe. You have to nail Doctor Doom. Yeah, Doctor Doom served as one of the inspirations for Darth Vader. It has to be nailed pitch perfect. Let me ask you this: I have two casting choices off the top of my head who I think would be perfect. Uh huh. As Victor Von Doom. Okay, who? Let me ask you if you have any off the top of your I head. I don't, so you could just say what you're... What you're There's been two that I've been thinking about for a while. One of them is a Game of Thrones alum. The other one is a Christopher Nolan Batman verse alum. The Game of Thrones alum I would choose is Nikolai Koster Waldo. Is he the guy also who plays Ramsey Bolton? No. Oh, okay, I was going to say. <laughs> He's Jamie fucking Lannister. Oh, okay, Jamie Lannister, yeah who has the best arc overall in all of Game of Thrones, the books and the show, to be 100% honest with you. Uh-huh. And you need someone who can portray that sort of arc for Victor Von Doom. Let's say in a hypothetical world you were to bring Doom and he would kill T'Challa. Well, here's the cold hard facts. To the world, he's a villain. 
to his country. He's a hero. He's, he's a hero. So you need someone who can juggle that perfectly. Who better than Jamie fucking Lannister? Yeah. I, to do that. I could see it. Yeah. My other option would be if you've seen Peaky Blinders, if you know who Scarecrow is, I would choose Killian Murphy to perhaps play Victor Von Doom. Wasn't he already in the MCU? I thought he was already a character in the MCU before. No. No? Okay. No, but I also think he would be absolutely perfect. If you want to do some research on Killian Murphy, one movie I'd highly recommend is Sunshine, directed by Danny Boyle, also starring Marvel alum Chris Evans. Hmm. Yeah, Killian Murphy would be awesome. He'd be like a really awesome, perfect, like, safe pick. Right. Yeah, there's already a ton of fan art out there for him as Doctor as Doom. Doctor Doom. It, I mean, it works perfectly, but I just think it. it if you're going to cast Doctor Doom, you have to cast Reed Richards, and you have to make sure that there's chemistry there. That that right. You can't have some like scrub. Not I, they're not going to cast a scrub to be Reed Richards, but you have to have a, an actor on the same like level as Killian Murphy. Right. As like. You have to have a guy on on his level as Reed Richards too. It can't just be. I'm really, you know. as part of the reason why I'm really hoping that uh that John Krasinski is going to play an alternate universe Captain America because I'd like for him to play the main Marvel universe cinematic universe Reed Richards. Yeah. So I'm hoping that that rumor is really just you know a bunch of hubbub. Yeah, I hope so too because I feel like he is the perfect pick. Him and his wife too. Um. Oh, I mean, come on, is freaking emily uh emily blunt is as sue storm yeah it just it kind of writes itself and i think that's why that fan casting has 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 gone has gotten so wild yeah wildly popular is because it's just so perfect it is so perfect it just doesn't make any sense uh why right. why you wouldn't go that route and and i'll say it again we say i say this every time we talk about the fantastic four on this podcast but Rain Wilson as the Mole Man for the Fantastic Four movie has to happen. Perfect. Even, has to happen. even if it's just in the beginning of the movie, um, where it's where like they're they're stopping like a really like small side hero or side villain, um, in the beginning of the movie, uh, it'd be perfect. Like Mole Man, you have to do Mole Man. You just got it. You got to do Mole Man. <laughs> in, a, in an alternate Marvel universe, Stanley should be playing Nick Fury. <laughs> Just get all the office. Yeah, all the office. the office. Yeah, the, Pam plays Pepper Potts, and then and then Michael. Uh, what's his name? Um, oh man, Michael Scott. Yeah, Michael Scott. But like the Steve Carell plays like a like a like a dude. Like a, you know how they're in Hollywood, they have those those people that walk around in costumes playing like pretending like they're a yeah. superhero or a supervillain. He's one of those people pretending to be Doctor Doom. Oh, uh, that would be hilarious. That'd be Michael super Scott fun. as Doctor Doom. Michael Scott as Doctor Doom would be super funny. Personally, <laughs> Toby is Doctor Strange. Toby, Toby, yeah, yeah. We'll see. I it'd be it'd be interesting to see how they would they would handle every every character, but um, that would be really fun to see. And I I just I have to throw that in there every time we talk about the Fantastic Four. It'd be really funny to see Rain Wilson as Mole Man, for sure. It'd be perfect. It'd be perfect. I think he would be. He should be the main villain of the first Fantastic Four. Yeah, why not? Build up Mole Man. Doctor Doom can can come later. Definitely come well, up. Well, you know, he, dude, he's he's above Thanos level. Yeah. Like, honest to God, as much as I love Thanos, especially now that Thanos has passed Darth Vader as the most search antagonist in Google history. Really? So respects to the MCU and respect to the master, Josh Brolin. But uh Doctor Doom has to he has to exceed Thanos level. He has to, man. Doctor Doom is the bad guy. He is Marvel. Yeah. Like when you think bad guys, you think Doctor Doom. Yeah, it has to be. He has to super. He has to be above. He has to be worse than Thanos. And what better way than by killing Black Panther? T'Challa. Dude, yeah. By killing Black Panther, Do and honestly, you can go further. There should be a second hero that he kills. I don't know who that would be. I'm not gonna. Okay. I'm not. I'm not gonna say no. I'm not gonna say any. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna name names. But I'm just saying, if he, if if that, if Doctor Doom is the way that they're going to kind of thin uh, out the Marvel cast, the Marvel uh, catalog of heroes a little bit, because there are 
with all the new characters that they're unveiling too, and that they're going to be bringing in, it's going to be difficult to juggle everything. If you thought that how they handled phases one through three was great, I mean, they're they're not going to stop introducing characters. I mean, the X Men is on the is on the horizon. Fantastic Four is on the horizon. They're bringing in the Eternals. So like, there's a lot of characters they're going to have to juggle, and if they're going to go down in the multiverse. They're gonna have to, you know, be able to handle all these different characters. At some point, they're going to have to either kill off characters or write them right. out. And what better way than to, to than to bring in Doctor Doom, who is the Marvel bad guy? Would it be hilarious if he killed Loki? If Loki just died every time, <laughs> like there was a, a an Infinity War Endgame event, he just Loki dies. was the guy. He dies. <laughs> that would be funny. That would make sense. That'd make a lot of sense. Well, the thing about Doctor Strange, what makes, I mean, Doctor Doom, which makes him such a uh, worthy adversary, is that he's able to blend the uh, technology and the mystic arts. He's like an Iron Man, Doctor Strange fusion. Yeah. So if he's going to take out anyone besides Black Panther, strong, strong consideration that maybe it should be Doctor Strange. I agree. I agree. Um, or maybe maybe he's the one that takes out Ron that restores balance. Yeah, possibly. It'll be very interesting to see where things go. He turns into a hero. People are like, yeah, Mr. Ron Davis. <laughs> yeah, it'll be interesting to see where things go. But right now, I think we need to go over to the sports talk and then hit with Weekly Rex. So, hope you enjoyed this conversation. But here is our NFL Games of the Week. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed that conversation between me and Quinn uh, regarding the Marvel Cinematic Universe and all the news surrounding it that has come out recently. Now it is time for our weekly NFL talk, uh, where we give you our picks for the games of the week for week four. But first, we're going to recap the games of the week for week three, which one of them just finished tonight. We are recording on Monday night this segment. And the Chiefs utterly toppled the Baltimore Ravens, uh, a grand total of 34 to 20. Uh, Patrick Mahomes scored a f- total of five touchdowns. Uh, Lamar Jackson just could didn't seem to be able to get anything going. Uh, only threw for 98 yards, and uh, I believe he ran in one touchdown. Uh, so, Quinn, it's it appears that Patrick Mahomes heard you. Uh, and your your uh, disdain for his uh, team last week, and just answered the call. Well, I'd say disdain is a strong word, but it was definitely a call to action for young yeah. Patrick Mahomes. Um, look, I mean, standout performance. You know, I think ultimately, for me, you know, I hesitate to put him in the uh, in the Aaron Rodgers elite of the elite class based on the body of work, which I'm sure you know he'll make up in time. But as of right now, I do think he's in that second tier. Um, and I would have had Lamar Jackson in that in that tier with him. I still do. I still do. It was a poor performance by the Baltimore Ravens mm-hmm. this week. Yeah. But just beneath, you know, like a Rodgers and a Russell Wilson, you have, you know, the, the Rodgers and Wilson are to me the one and two quarterbacks in this league. Right, really? Right beneath them, I would go. Uh, Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. Would Josh Allen be in that second tier for you as well? Not yet, but as of right now, Josh Allen, I think, is uh, is the MVP. Really? In your opinion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? I mean, wow. 3-0 and record was... team. Yeah. Uh, he's thrown four touchdowns in, what, the last three games? Uh, Yeah. He has over uh... 1,000 passing yards. In only three games. Uh huh. And um, he had a fourth quarter comeback against a staunch Rams defense on Sunday. So, looking at the field of competition for the Buffalo Bills, yeah, I lean towards Josh uh-huh. Allen getting the MVP, the MVP trophy. Plus, as of right now, he's the most dual threat quarterback there is. I think the real competition for Josh Allen 
is Russell Wilson right now, and that pains me to say, pains me to my very core. And, and I that's say, exactly who who is my MVP for the, up until. I say yeah. Josh Allen is the premier dual threat quarterback right now over Lamar Jackson, over Patrick Mahomes, because right now the Buffalo Bills are utilizing the advantages of having um, a freaking linebacker for a quarterback uh, yeah. more so than Baltimore has been utilizing Lamar Jackson mm -hmm. or the Chiefs have utilized Patrick Mahomes. Patrick Mahomes typically only scrambles as an escape. It's never his first option. Yeah. So I would say right now Josh Allen is the premier dual threat quarterback. Wow. Well, I I just I have him with Kyler behind. Murray close behind. Interesting. I have uh my my top three for MVP goes Wilson, Rogers, Allen. Those would um, be my top three too. I have Wilson as my MVP currently just because the dude has thrown 14 touchdowns in the past three weeks. That is the most by any quarterback over the first three weeks of the season, eclipsing Patrick Mahomes of last year, I believe, or two years ago, one of the two, and Peyton Manning from uh, 2013 when he threw 12. So he has made history over the first three weeks. Um, he hasn't put up he hasn't put up a thousand yards yet, but he put up 925 uh, over these past uh, three weeks and has only thrown one interception against the Patriots. Um, so he it would have been 15 touchdowns if it wasn't for DK Metcalf getting sloppy with it and uh, getting uh, his catch punched out mm -hmm. by the defensive back for the Cowboys rugs. All those big but, weights he's lifting in the weight room. Ain't none of it going to help that tiny brain. How could you make <laughs> such an error? That was a pretty, uh, that was a pretty crazy error, but, because More like JV Metcalf, <laughs> nice. But um, I think that, in my opinion, just Russell Wilson is just head and shoulders. He's like willing this team. Aaron Rodgers and Josh Allen, I feel like more are are closer linked. Um, they're like also a, the beneficiary of better teams. Yeah, and they're a head. It's a head to head battle in the sense of uh, just overall like like style of play too. They're very similar, but yeah. you have to give it to Rogers in my opinion over Josh Allen, because through the first three weeks, the bills have played the Miami dolphins scrubs and I believe the jets. Yeah. I think they played the jets scrubs and, and then, then they play the Rams legit. So like with all of that in mind, um, they, they played one, really good team the Packers on the other hand have played just pulling it up now I believe they played yeah they played Minnesota the Lions and the Saints two divisional rivals and then a perennial playoff contender which is almost exactly like the the schedule for the Bills but I would argue that the Lions and the Vikings both are better teams overall than the Jets and the, the far and away far and away the Lions yeah. almost pulled one off against Arizona yesterday, didn't they? Yeah, they were very close to it. The Lions very are close. always very close to winning a <laughs> to winning a couple games. I feel like they're always really close in beating Arizona too. Like that's the one team they're just always right there, but they always end up very losing. similar franchises. Yeah, they are very similar franchises. Very similar. Um, but all this talk about the Bills, it does, you know, kind of pivot us naturally towards your game of the week for last week, which was the Bills and Rams, which you've been alluding to. You did talk about this game on Hang 10, our Monday show. But really quickly, what's the biggest takeaway from this game that you saw, Quinn? Uh, my biggest takeaway from the Bills is, uh, one, was the leadership of Josh Allen, how he was able to rally uh, the team around him, go down the field, and get the game-winning touchdown. That's exactly the kind of development you want to see in your franchise quarterback. You know, mm. we, you've been able to you've been able to mark uh, milestones of progression in Josh Allen's career. Uh, quite True. opposite of you know a guy like Carson Wentz, you're marking milestones of regression. Yeah. Um. So very I true. thought you know I thought the Josh Allen played very well. He's been lights out these past three weeks. Uh, Stephon Diggs you know, was 
had one of his tougher games, but he is uh, going against one of the better defenses. I think, you know, obviously I'm biased, but one of the better defenses in the league, at least personnel wise. Mm-hmm. Um, Devin Singletary had a good game. Um, but, you know, if I'm a Bills fan, would I walk away from this game, one, with a huge sigh of relief that you were able to, you know, get that two minute fourth quarter comeback victory? Um, you know, out of your relatively young franchise quarterback, you know, that's something to hang your hat on. Oh, Regardless yeah. of what happens in the future, you can look back to this game and you could say, okay, there are, there are clear signs of leadership and fortitude here that we as a franchise can build around. I agree. So as a Bills, as you know, if you're a Bills fan, that's what you're looking out for. If you're a Rams fan, um, you know, there's no such thing as a good loss. But what you do come away from this game is uh, you come away with a sense of pride in the resiliency of your team. You were down 28-3 to at the half, and you come back and take the lead with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. That, yeah. sh- that, shows, that shows tremendous team. That takes a tremendous team to do that. So as a Rams fan, what I see when, you know, when we overcome a hurdle like that, I see that we're, we're real cohesive. We're all in unison. We're all striving and working together. Uh, for the same goal, but we're on the same page. Yeah. Uh, I also, you know, we're coming away again with the number one uh, rushing attack in the NFL. Sean McVay is sticking to the game plan, which is something he hasn't always done, particularly last year. I felt like we kind of got away from it. We would, you know, pull some crazy shit out of our asses. Mm -hmm. But what we did see in this game against the Buffalo Bills, we saw the commitment to the running game. Daryl Henderson having another 100-yard game. He's establishing himself perhaps separating himself from Malcolm Brown and Cam Akers. Now it's a little premature, but maybe. Yeah. So as a Rams fan, we're just walking away with the, you know, is no, it's no such thing as a good loss, but it was a great, great team effort to come back um, from 28, three at the half. It almost feels like the bills didn't win, but that we didn't do enough to win. If that mm. makes sense. I see. Yeah. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, we'll be looking. I think these are two playoff teams. Yeah, truly, I think these are two teams that have been playing some of the better football this early in the season, which shows the preparation that they put in in the off season mm-hmm. compared to some of the uh, you know opposite teams. Yeah. Um. So you know it's looking real good for uh for both franchises for both fan bases. How about uh, how about your game of the week? What are your takeaways from it? Yeah, real quick for my game of the week, which was the Ravens and Chiefs. I mean, my takeaway is that Patrick Mahomes, uh, unlike your take, which I respect. I mean, I understand it, definitely. Um, but Mahomes is the reigning MVP, Super Bowl champion, um, you know, defending Super Bowl champion. And uh, he definitely played like it tonight. I think that um, the the Chiefs are, are turning into a veteran team. Uh, you know, like you look at the veteran teams of the league led by veteran quarterbacks, such as Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, they're able to have games where they don't necessarily play to, to their level that they could, uh, much like they did uh, against the Chargers uh, a couple weeks ago. They very much squeaked out that win. They didn't dominate the Chargers, which they probably could have, but they didn't. And but yet they still were able to win. And that's those are the types of wins that you need going forward to be able to, uh, even when you're not playing your best, you still are able to pull it out. And those guys, Russell Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, definitely do that, uh, you know, week in and week out where, you know, there's some games where they just dominate and it's over. Like before it even starts, you'd already know it's over. And then there's other games where, you know, they may not be on all the time, but they still are able to pull it out. Mahomes is like that. Uh, he's turning into a vet before our eyes. You know, you say with Josh Allen too, uh, he's hitting certain milestones. Uh, you're seeing Mahomes do the same thing, in my opinion. And you know, with Lamar Jackson pivoting to Lamar and the Baltimore Ravens, they're a good team. They're going to be there at the very end, and I predict it's going to be Chiefs Ravens AFC Championship game. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if the Bills are in there too, but I really do think that these two quarterbacks uh, are going to be able to get their teams to the AFC Championship game. And uh, it's a long season just because the Ravens have not been able to beat the Chiefs 
up to this point, they're three and zero with Lamar as a starter. Um, doesn't mean that they're not going to be able to to make this a rivalry. Um, it's gonna they're both these quarterbacks are going to be in the league for a long time, and you know at the end of the day, uh, to me it just seemed like the Chiefs defense played and wanted it more than the Ravens defense, and that's what it kind of came down mm. to for for our, my game of the week. Very much so. Uh, the Chiefs defense went out. They had something to prove, and they definitely proved it. They shut down Lamar Jackson, who, uh, you know, an MVP in his own right. So they they definitely made their point. And uh, now going forward, it's it's now time for the Ravens to respond. And uh, what better team to respond against than their uh, close rival in uh, terms of geography, the uh, Washington Football Club. So that'll be a very interesting <laughs> game, but it is not my game of the week. That's not my game of the week. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Who is the better Andy Reid quarterback? Patrick Mahomes or Donovan McNabb? Has Patrick Mahomes done enough in his short career to eclipse Donovan McNabb as Andy Reid's best quarterback? Yeah, he won a Super Bowl. Like, come on. <laughs> what else can he... What do you mean? I don't know, what do man. you mean? Donovan, we have five NFC championships, one Super Bowl oh. appearance. I mean, that's oh, please. I, he oh, never, please. he never won the big one, but, but man, you, you know, you got to give some recognition to second place to the. Silver oh yeah, medals. no, I, I, I give, I give, uh, I give recognition to Donovan, Donovan McNabb. I think he was a great quarterback, uh, um, a little ahead of his time with a style of play, and uh, I got nothing but love for Donovan. Let me ask you this: McNabb. If Patrick Mahomes retired. After this season, without winning the Super Bowl, would you still have him above Don McNabb? Yes. Okay. I have Nick Foles above Donovan McNabb because he won a Super Bowl. Oh, you're for tripping. the for the team that Donovan McNabb couldn't get it done with. But Andy, the franchise, I Andy Reid wasn't the coach of the Eagles when the when they won. That. True. Very true. I'm just I, saying the franchise. But, but uh, oh man, you're super <laughs> Nick Foles. <laughs> Dude, Nick Foles is a legend, man. They have do they have a statue of Donovan McNabb outside of that stadium? No. Do they have a statue of Nick Foles? They do. Listen, this is also a city that has a statue of a fictional character. Their 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 greatest sports icon is not a real person. I'm so? talking about Rocky Balboa. So let's let's caveat caveat that with a little bit of, you know. Uh, well, if you want to talk about, if you want to talk about cities and statues, I mean, LA is like the, the capital, the Mecca of statues of fi- fictional characters. So I'm oh, not no, gonna... no, you're definitely not wrong there. I guess, I guess the point I'm making is that Philadelphia is an overrated sports town. Oh, geez. You just love, you love, you, <laughs> all these, all these sports cities. Let me tell you, don't wear a flannel weekend around weekend. me. Cause if you got buttons, I'll press them. Oh my God, man. I've Everyone's, never been to no, Philadelphia, no, but <laughs> I know you have. No one is safe. No one is safe. But I'm talking about people that have booed Santa. I mean, come on, man. <laughs> Nobody is safe. But the game of the week, your game of the week, Quinn. It's arguable that both of these teams, regardless of the outcome of this next week, week four, will be safe in terms of playoff hopes. Would you say? Uh, it's very possible my game of the week um, coming up in week four, my game for you to watch is the Pittsburgh Steelers versus the Tennessee Titans. Um, they'll be playing in the early game on CBS. That's 7 a.m. my time, so wherever you are, do the math. Um, I believe they're both 3-0. and Yeah, they're both 3-0. and um, Both run-heavy teams. James Conner versus Derrick Henry. I do like Tennessee in this matchup. Mm. I think they're the more complete team. Ryan Tannehill has surprised me. He has impressed me. He is slowly (laughs) carving out a place for himself as the franchise quarterback in Nashville. Which I predicted. Which you predicted. But it will be interesting to see. Two very staunch defenses. Two, frankly, very similar teams. Similar in makeup, similar in build, similar in coaching style. Yeah. Um, and one of these O's has got to go. And I'm predicting 
in a close game that the Pittsburgh Steelers take the L 13 to 10. I'm going wow. I'm going with the Tennessee Titans. Tennessee, 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 Tennessee <laughs> Titans. 13 to 10, Derrick Henry. I'm going to go 70 rushing yards, two touchdowns. And I, wow. I think that will uh that will get him over the edge. A missed field goal will make it 13. A mixed extra point will make it 13 to 10. Wow. Okay. So you're you're predicting Boswell Chris Boswell to miss a field goal in that game. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, we'll see. I mean, that's very That's that, a that, that let me tell you that that that's an eight ball bold prediction. That that is a bold prediction. Boswell's yeah. not a bad kicker. And so let me tell you if if Boswell misses a kiss a kick. If Boswell <laughs> misses a kick this weekend, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> you did. And uh, you know, I will uh I will concur with you, actually. I, I will agree with you. I I think that the Tennessee Titans are the better team. You know, we went into this season, both you and I, with the same feelings against uh, the Steelers. We thought that this team was basically done, and we thought that Big Ben done. wasn't gonna be able to play uh to this level that he has been. It's surprising and uh, you know, good for Steelers fans and all. But uh He's in the American I, badass part of his Undertaker career. Yeah, exactly. And I think that with him no motorcycle th- pun intended yeah no more <laughs> i think that uh it's going to be a more competitive game in terms of scoring than than you think i think this is a, a game where the defenses kind of become absent mm. um you know the defense uh, when uh, the tennessee Titans played minnesota last week the defense kind of just went to sleep they didn't really do a whole lot in terms of uh forcing any sort of turnovers um i do have the stats here but it doesn't look like i'm able to see if there were any turnovers correct me if i'm wrong of course but they just weren't as impressive as i thought they were going to be um same with this steelers defense everybody going into the season a lot of the uh, talking heads were praising the steelers defense saying that they were going to be staunch and all this stuff they've been okay but i mean they almost lost to the tennessee titans or not tennessee titans the houston texans uh, last game so these are both teams that do have holes on the defensive side, and I'm going to predict that the Tennessee Titans beat the Pittsburgh Steelers by one point, Ooh. 24 to 23, Tennessee. It's going to be a nail biter. I think it's going to go down to the wire, but at the in the end, I think Tannehill and uh, Derek Henry get it done on the. How offense, do you think my man Juju Smith Schuster is going to do? Um, if I were to predict Juju's output. He had a decent game I, last uh, yesterday. I think he's going to, I'd say, 80 yards, six catches, and a touchdown. And uh, just to offer you your correction, Ryan Tannehill did throw an interception uh, yesterday against the Vikings. Oh, okay. But it looks like For that sure. may be his only one. Okay. Did the Tennessee Titans have any interceptions, or did they have any turnovers? Uh, they picked the ball off twice from Kirk Cousins yesterday. Okay. All right makes sense so i guess that brings me to my game of the week which is very interesting quinn that you picked the steelers versus the titans because i'm picking the two teams that each of those teams played in week three and i'm talking about the loser leaves town match of the week the Minnesota Vikings 0 and 3 going up against the Houston Texans 0 and 3. And I'm I'm tell I'm saying it right now. Whoever loses this game is out of the playoff hunt. Oh, Week wow. 4 already. They're done in my opinion. I'm well, not going to I know it's bold, but listen. You got to be you got to you got to you got to lay it all out there sometimes and um this these Minnesota Vikings and Houston Texans have underperformed both in their own right. Both were playoff teams last year. Uh, Minnesota last play in the playoffs last year. Very surprising when they were able to get that win and uh, competed heavily, <coughs> competed heavily against uh, the San Francisco 49ers, whom they uh, succumbed to in that game. Houston Texans were able to survive the current MVP in Quinn's eyes, Josh Allen. And uh, 
were able to, you know, get to the divisional round um, of the playoffs before succumbing to the Kansas City Chiefs in a historic win by the Kansas City Chiefs. Jumping to this season, um, both teams are 0-3, and they have both faced pretty tough schedules up to this point. The Minnesota Vikings have uh, played the Packers, the Colts, and the Titans, while the Texans have played the Chiefs, the Ravens, and the Steelers to start their season. So none of these teams have really been afforded any favors here, but nonetheless, these two teams were good enough to at least take one of those games. Like, I believed that the Minnesota Vikings are good enough to beat the Colts, but yet they got punked by them. Same with the Texans. I thought they were good enough and were winning for most of the game against the Steelers, but in the end, just faltered. So, I think, in the end, whoever loses this game, it's it's just going to be a, a... It's going to speed up their descent down the toilet bowl, so to speak. And I'm going to actually say that it is the... Uh, Minnesota Vikings that lose this game and it all comes down to quarterback. And I just have more faith in Deshaun Watson than I do Kirk cousins. And I don't like that. that. I do not like that. I'm sorry. I think, uh, you know, for everything that I've talked shit about JJ Watt, I might have on this podcast. Just, I feel like he's overhyped at this point. Um, he just gets hurt every year, which isn't on him, but his like, I don't know every year he gets into the playoffs and they just don't really do anything. And he makes some plays. And I know that he's just one guy on the defensive end. Um, But this year it just feels different watching him play. I feel like this is really his last hurrah in a way. And no one's really talking about it. He's been in the league for quite a while now. And as a defensive player, you know, who who hits hard and also takes a lot of hits in his own right. um, You know, I don't, I don't know how many more years he has in him. So I really think that, J.J. Watt is going to be the difference in this upcoming game because he knows what's on the line. And he's going to take out Kirk Cousins, not injure him, but just he's going to pressure him, make him make dumb mistakes, which uh, Kirk Cousins is prone to do. And uh, the Texans are going to win this game, I'll say, 30-24. to 24. Wow. Yep. I'm gonna That's go, my prediction. Just for the sake of being a contrarian, I'm going to go Vikings 21, Houston 17. Mm. And that's simply because Dalvin Cook is starting to turn it on. I see. Yeah, the running game very well could be the difference I think they'll lean on Dalvin Cook to keep uh, Deshaun Watson on the sideline. Otherwise, um, yeah, I would pick Houston to win. But I think Dalvin Cook's going to bring it home for him. I think what's really been interesting is watching the offensive progression – or just the offense as a whole struggle for Minnesota since getting rid of Stephon Diggs. Yeah. Who was their perceived number two receiver. Mm -hmm. It's looking like perhaps Stephon Diggs was really their number one receiver. It's interesting. No disrespect to the man, Adam Thielen, but (laughs) it's pretty interesting that you bring up uh, wide receivers because on the other side of this game, you have a team that's kind of lost a step ever since they traded away DeAndre Hopkins for seemingly no reason. That's very true. Their offense is slow. Um, I think it's probably just because Bill O'Brien's a racist. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't believe Bill O'Brien's a racist. It was just. <laughs> it was just right there to say. <laughs> I will say that um, his beef with DeAndre Hopkins made no sense. <laughs> It, it, I agree. As a football coach, wouldn't you want the best players on your team, regardless of <laughs> talking about I one mean, of look, the top three receivers in the NFL? And you're just like, I don't like your attitude. I mean, look, like, I mean, John Gruden for the Raiders, even after Antonio Brown leaked their phone call where he was like, "You're a grinder, man. I want you on this team." Yeah, you know, even after he, even after he leaked that, Ooh. yeah, hey. <laughs> even after he leaked that, Gruden was still like. I still want him on my team. It's because it, it, it's because John Gruden's a veteran, a veteran coach who knows how to play the game. And now that he finally has a team built around the uh, philosophy that he has, man, that's why the Raiders are rolling. Yeah. Bill Bryan has no offensive philosophy. In fact, here's a bold prediction from Quinkle Tinkle Stars himself: <laughs> at the end of the season, 
Bill O'Brien, Bill O'Brien, Bill O'Brien will be back in Dubuque, Iowa, competing for the best chili in town cook-off. Dang. Instead of preparing for another offseason with the Houston Texans. Wow. As your Quinkle Tinkle Stars hot take. That's a hot take. Well, that's... A- that's a not even really a, a hot yeah, take. That's, that's not really a hot. Luke, that's a lukewarm take. Stick that's your finger an, in that chili, and it's kind of cold at this point. That, that's kind of like an over-expired like tub of chili that you bought like at a Wendy's. couple weeks. Yeah, a couple that's weeks ago, Wendy's you just chili. forgot, and you forgot all about it in your refrigerator, and you're just yeah. like, "Oh, this is still here." Yeah. Oh fuck! And you like just toss it. Finally, that's what the Texans are going to do after this season. I think that even if they make the playoffs, they're still going to get rid of them. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they lose this game that, you know, the talk is going to start right there. They might just fire him there. Who's just another, go interim. Who's another coach on the hot seat for you? Who is another or were you going to give us another one? Who is another? Uh, it's got uh, uh, to gotta uh, be Gase, um, Adam Gase for the Jets. Ad, oh, well, Adam Gase de- deserves to be fired. And also, I'm not going to say this guy deserves to be fired, but on the other side of the ball, uh, Coach um, Zubiak, is that his name? Gary Zubiak of the Minnesota Vikings? Oh, wait, he's the... Uh, Q- Kubiak, Kubiak, not Yeah, Zubiak. yeah, yeah, he used to be the head coach for the Broncos back in the day. Yeah, Gary Kubiak, he's a great coach. Um, I just think that offensively, they're missing Kevin Stefanski, who is now the head coach of the Cleveland Browns, and, um, and he, what he brought to the offense. Never underestimate the importance of of an offensive coordinator man they are ruining adam gay at uh sam darnold's career in in new jersey ain't they if i were sam darnold i would want a trade i would request a trade tomorrow but where Before would you the play deadline? yeah but where would you play denver denver go, needs a quarterback go go back up go back up somewhere take the rest of the year off <laughs> You know, let, if I were let him, your body would... heal up and and, yeah. and compete for a next year starting spot, I'd say go to Jacksonville, take on take on porn stash himself, Garner, Garner Minshew, the boy Garner. I would say if I were if I were Sam Darnold and just magically could, you know, wish myself on any team, I would actually try to compete for uh, that Minnesota Vikings job. I know mm. that they, I know that they have a lot of money tied up in Kirk Cousins, um, but seeing how a lot that. of, well, of course they do, but seeing as um, how NFL contracts kind of just work, they're able to be re- reworked pretty easily under the CBA, and uh, they could shed a lot of that money if they really wanted to, and they wanted to move with Sam Darnold. So no I would try to go there. Than the Rams, that's for sure. It's true. We're playing. We're playing Madden with the salary cap turned off. I know. Yeah, L.A. But, Lakers, uh, like I say. But Sam yes. Darnold. Here's another mm-hmm. spot. Dark mm-hmm. horse spot. Dallas. No, they just paid Dak. They literally just paid him. Did they resign Dak? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I thought really? Dak was going to get franchised at the end of the year. Let me make sure that I'm not mistaken on that. Oh yeah, they were unable to reach a deal. Yeah, they were unable to reach the deal. Yeah, you're right. They do Dak, not have Dak wants that Jared Goff money. Which I in my opinion he definitely He's worth it. I th- I definitely think he's worth it. Yeah. I wonder if yeah, this that, was a secret ploy by the Rams to set the market at all these key positions just so other teams can't match it with their small town revenue. Maybe that wouldn't surprise me. Speaking of small town stuff, um, I don't know how that segues us into anything. I mean, there's a lot of people who like documentaries in small towns, but that brings us to our weekly Rex. Hooray. All right. I don't have any weekly Rex for this week, actually, but Quinn has two of them. So Quinn, what are you? You said there was two documentaries that you wanted to plug this week. There was I'm curious two. what those are. I amended it to one documentary and one food chain. Oh. So pick your poison. Which one would you rather hear first? Entertainment or... Uh... Let's do the food chain first. All right. My food chain that I am recommending to you. Let me tell you something. 
it gets hot as fuck in Sacramento County. That is true. Hot as absolute shit. Guess you're on your hot. lunch break. You're looking for something to eat. You don't want that hot food. You want something cool. You want yeah. something to cool you down. Well, I, I can't agree. think of no better place on old Bruceville Road. Right next to the UPS store 1040. Bruceville. Our alma mater. <laughs> Go get you a spicy Sorry. poke bowl. Oh. From my number one. Poke location in all of Sacramento County, and that is Hokey Poke on, uh, it's not off Bruceville. What the fuck am Elk I saying? Elk Grove Boulevard. Elk Grove Boulevard. Off Elk Grove Boulevard in the, uh, in the shopping center with, uh, Labu. Lab- Labu. Labu. Uh, Dollar Tree. Dollar Tree. <laughs> UPS Ty Store Chili. 1040. Tie Chili. But most importantly, skip all that shit. Go straight to Hokey Poke. Get yourself a spicy poke bowl. Maybe you like a show you poke bowl. But the point of what I'm trying to tell you is, is that in the relentless year-round heat, go take a load off Annie with good, healthy alternatives to what is in your surrounding area, your McDonald's, your Taco Bills. You don't need none of that shit. That shit ain't going to make you strong. That's not gonna get you in the Nick Diaz army. Unless you're poor, then you want to be in the Nick Diaz army. Well, then you gotta eat like you're in the Nick Diaz army. And what better way to eat than to eat raw fish, clean fish, seaweed salad? I think that's kind of an oxymoron. Clean fish. I don't think that exists, but all right. And other vegetables. Maybe stay away from the crab. It is called imitation crab. <laughs> it is imitation crab. And Still odds are, good, it probably came from the Delta. Oh, yeah. So I don't trust the crab. But what I like to get, I like to get the ahi tuna. I like to get the salmon. And I like to get that crunch, that octopi. Mm. On top of a seaweed salad, run it through the garden, get all your veggies on there. Make sure you get those superfoods for that gut bacteria. And then if you're a real G, you get chopsticks. Yeah. And then you just go to town. Hokey, poke off old, off uh, Elk, Grove Elk Grove Boulevard. Yeah. Um, that's the my spot. Favorite, my favorite sauce is the Ono Spicy. Ono Spicy. I like to get the Ono Spicy, and I like to mix it with the island heat. Now, disclaimer, not a lot of Hawaiians work in there. <laughs> True. In fact, there's probably damn near none. <laughs> there's no, I've never seen a Hawaiian work there in my life. So while it is somewhat ironic that our culture has been gentrified and commoditized to sell you a delicious snack, take the hit and enjoy the food because it is quite frankly delicious and it is the premier poke location in Sacramento County. I can't recommend it enough. If I had a t shirt, I'd be wearing it right now, goddammit. It is that good. Tell him Quinn sent you. <laughs> See what that gets what, what'd you. you. What would you call yourself? Qu- Quinkle Toes or whatever? What would you call yourself? Quinkle, Quinkle Tinkle toes? Stars. Yeah, Quinkle, Quinkle Tinkle, Tinkle Stars. My first my first ever gamer tag on really? Xbox in our clan, Clan 270, Call of Duty Modern Warfare, The Undefeated Crew. Wow. Uh, my gamer tag was Quinkle. 81. Wow. Quinkle, take a tinkle and knife somebody in the back. Um, <laughs> yeah, go to Hokey Pokey. Eat healthy. Uh, Coming out of this pandemic, I cannot stress this enough, people. The number one pre existing condition is obesity. Across the board, we are one of the fattest nations on this planet. And instead of taking that $10 and going to get you a freaking uh, double quarter pounder deluxe with the extra large Dr. Pepper and an extra large fry, goddamn, that sounds good. We can't deny that. But look down. Have you seen your penis in a while? Shit, I reckon probably not. Go to Hokey Pokey. 
Eat good. Wow. Eat fresh. Thanks for the subway ad. Um, so what is your recommendation for the documentary? I'm curious. We're sticking with the ocean. I watched a documentary on Netflix. It was mesmerizing. It was beautiful. It touched a deep, dark place inside of me, past the loins, to the core of my huevos, deviled egg. I'm talking about my octopus teacher is the name of the documentary on oh, Netflix. Wow. I'm going to bring you the name of the filmmaker. But it was a tremendous documentary um, that essentially focuses on this man who is uh, who's somewhat lost. He's going through a bit of a midlife crisis. He's a documentarian. Uh-huh. He goes, he, he lives in uh, South Africa and he's just going out into this reef and one day he spots an octopus. Oh. And over the course of a year, this man and this octopus form a relationship beyond that of a wild animal and a man, beyond that of a domesticated animal and of a man. You're really seeing insane cinematography that puts a uh, evocative emotional output and res- and receptors on this cephalopod. Hmm. That's interesting. A creature whose mouth we can't see. Right. We just see its eyes and its large bulbous head. Yeah. But when this animal is distressed, we are distressed. When this animal feels joy, we feel joy. It was an absolutely spectacular documentary. It is my early pick for documentary of the year, and it is one of the top ten films I've seen all year. Wow. It is truly and utterly tremendous. It is poignant. It is cheerful. It is sad at parts. And it is celebratory in most. I really came away watching it with a renewed sense of appreciation for the natural world uh, around us. Mm. And how there is so much more that can be tapped into if we as a species, the human species, were able to shed ourselves of our technological and societal oppressive states and were able to reconnect more with the natural state. Mm. with the earth yeah so I would highly encourage any and all if you're not going to watch this documentary at the very least take your shoes off go step in that cool grass feel the dew on your feet on your bare Mm. skin Mm. take in a big old gulp of that fresh air unless you're you know unless you're in Northern California, in which case I would recommend shallow breaths. <laughs> yeah, you got to be careful, depending <laughs> on where you are. Definitely, but uh, but that's cool. That sounds really interesting. It was I'll an amazing. It, it was an amazing documentary. Absolutely amazing. I heard it as a recommendation from a uh, from a show I frequently watch and have previously recommended on this channel, uh, Morning Combat, and uh, I can't recommend it enough. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm always intrigued. Cinematography, you know, as an as a abstract kind of idea, is uh, fairly easy to understand on the surface. But much like a glacier, you know, seventy percent of it is underwater. Now take all the intricacies of cinematography and put them underwater. Yeah. Holy shit! And the guy's not scuba diving at all. He's snorkeling. Oh, okay. So there's a extra uh, degree of difficulty that is uh, that is there t- for uh, for you guys to appreciate. So cool. I'm sure you guys have nothing to do. In fact, I know you guys have nothing to do because I have nothing to do. Even though I'm in school, I find blocks of time where I ain't got shit going on. Turn off the porn. Yeah, you will speak for yourself. Learn something. Learn something. Detail. Learn something about about our about our octopi brothers. Yeah, not so different from human beings. Well, I'll definitely check it out. 
but it seems like we're about at that time. We're almost at two hours now, so I will... It is time to bid everybody in to do. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Cultures Podcast. Please follow us on Instagram at The Closers Podcast, on Facebook at Closers Podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, We Are The Closers Podcast. Next week, we actually know who's going to be on the show next week. It is an old guest. Well, it's actually two guests that have been on this show previously. Um, in the first season, towards the end of the first season, I had a band on from New York called The Twelfth Human they are coming back on next week to talk about the state of the music industry in 2020 during the pandemic and all the intricacies that have come with that. They are also going to talk about what they've been up to ever since our first interview. Um, they've been up to a lot of cool stuff, a lot of cool stuff. So it'll be really cool to catch up with them. We're both really excited to talk to those guys. And uh, please tune in to Hang 10 with Quinn Kalani. Go back and listen. Listen to that. It came out on Monday. And I'm going to be closing out your week in style, as always, on Friday with closing out the week. We have a lot to talk about. Presidential debate, if you're listening to this on Wednesday, was just yesterday. So um, it's going to be very politic heavy, just like the other episodes have been. But that's the year we're living in. 2020 is an election year. Therefore, there's a lot of politics on the, on the, on the line. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So if you're interested, stay tuned for that. And on behalf of Quinn Kalani and the Closest Podcast... Take care.